I've been reading a couple of books on Christian apologetics, the importance of defending the faith and answering some of the tough questions that people have about Christianity. One of the books that I've been reading is by Tim Keller, who's a Presbyterian minister in New York City. Um, he's not seeker sensitive, a lot of fanfare, very traditional, but has 6,000 people in Manhattan in his church. And the guy's got a brilliant mind. He's um, written the book called The Reason for God, and he answers a lot of the tough questions, and I think it's important that that you know how to answer these questions. A lot of, of us here don't entertain these questions, but people in the world do. One thing they say about Christianity that's very, very offensive is uh, you claim to be the one true religion. You claim exclusivity. And uh, who do you think you are? There's other religions of the world that seem to be very valid. In fact, have a lot of followers. So what makes you think that you're superior and arrogant, that you are so particular, that you say there's only one way to God, which we quote from John 14, 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and no man can come unto the Father but by me. And so... That's offensive. Another thing that's very offensive to people in the world is when we talk about, in Christianity, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Another thing that bothers people in the world, if God is all-powerful and loving, then why does he con continue to allow so much human suffering? Why does God put up with the ISIS and evil and things? Evidently, if he is all-powerful, he's not strong enough or powerful enough to deal with evil and the devil. So therefore, the conclusion is, I think God does not exist. What about the issues concerning science and all these things we hear? And we hear right now uh, climate warming and that if we don't start doing something, that our earth that we live on is going to just be uninhabitable. Do you think that God was smart enough when he created the heavens and the earth to look down through time and that he planned for every person and every point in time and generation to be able to live on this planet? They go, oh my goodness, I didn't realize population growth. They didn't take that in consideration and we're going to be like rats and we're going to overrun the earth and God just wasn't a very good strategic planner. Now, I think we're responsible. We need to take care of what God's given to us. He's given us dominion over the fish in the sea and the fowls in the air and the animals on the earth. And we need to be good stewards. We need to take care of things. We don't need to pollute. But I don't think man can go above and beyond what God has ordained and planned. The end will not come until he says it's the end. I know we many times are concerned about people getting hold of nuclear weapons and destroying the earth and everything. I don't think man is smart enough and the enemy is powerful enough to trump what God has planned when he says the end and the consummation of the age is at my plan and timing. And he's in control. Other things that uh, trouble people that uh, is offensive and upsets them, and a lot of people just do not believe that if God is a true and loving God, why would he send people to hell? So I ask you, are you prepared to answer these questions? Are you prepared to explain these things? And when you come in contact with someone, I was talking to a person not long ago, and they were taking 
sin and putting it in certain categories. And I may have mentioned this several weeks ago or maybe a month or so ago. They said uh, a person who claims to be a lesbian or homosexual and continue to live that lifestyle, will they go to heaven? There's a real easy answer to that. And Jesus said this. You might think that this person, because the tower of Siloam fell on them, that they were more wicked than other people. Or when Pilate killed these people and mixed their blood with sacrifices, that they must have been more evil because of this horrific thing that happened to them. And Jesus says this concerning no matter what your lifestyle, what your philosophy is, or what you believe or what you think, if you do not repent, you will perish. I don't care who you are or where you come from, how smart you are, or what your propensity is, or what gender you are, or what you're thinking, doesn't matter if you're this or that or whatever. All must repent and come to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you don't repent, I don't care if you're a lesbian, homosexual, heterosexual, white, pink, green, or yellow, if you don't repent, you will perish. End of sentence. Does that make sense? Here's something I want to share with you today that um, in my introduction, just a quick sentence here. Tim Keller said in his book, uh, explains that most people in our culture believe that there is a God. A lot of people believe there is a God. And we can relate to him and go to heaven through leading a good life. I find a lot of people think that way. I believe in God, a person says. And I believe that when my time comes, I, I can stand on my own two feet before Almighty God, and He can look at my life and see that I was a good person and I lived a good life. And therefore, he will accept me. A lot of people think that. I think there are a lot of people in the church. I think a lot of people profess to be a Christian and they're still trying to earn their salvation through performance. And we even as Christians, been born again, and washed by the blood of the Lamb, are still trying to, in our mind, think that we can be better positioned or more accepted to God by the things we do. Now, don't misunderstand me. Don't take grace and abuse it and frustrate it by saying, well, I'm saved and redeemed. I can go live my life the way I want to. There's a lot of people who are falling into hyper-grace and abusing the grace of God. And he talks, Paul talks about that in Romans, sixth chapter. And he says, don't use God's grace as an excuse for your lousy, sinful lifestyle. And when we're born of God, spiritually, we are one with God, but we have a soul, a mind, a will, and emotions. And through the process of sanctification, being, being set apart unto God, the Holy Spirit works in us so we can begin to live a life that exemplifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So we see the importance of living a godly life, and God gives us everything we need, amen, to live a godly life. Now, we make mistakes along the way. I've made a, a few mistakes. I think in my lifetime I maybe made Two. First one was I enlisted in the United States Air Force. The second one, no. <laughs> that was good for me. That was the rod and the staff of God. <laughs> but um, 
I've come to realize that I can't get any more saved than when the day I was saved. Amen. I cannot add or take away from my salvation. Salvation is not conditional. Salvation is positional. Positional, here's what I mean. It's like this. It's not like conditional. One day I feel saved. One day I feel lost. Up and down. We do that. We are hard on ourselves because we look at some of the dumb things that we've done where we tripped, we fall, we messed up. And we say, oh, my goodness. God, will you forgive me? And I do confess my sins. You do confess your sins. But God has already washed us and cleansed us by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Which doesn't give us an excuse to do the wrong thing, but gives us the power to do the right thing. Can you say amen? Christianity teaches, if you're following along my notes, Roman numeral 2, Christianity teaches the opposite of salvation being merited by living a good life. You cannot earn your way to heaven. You cannot work your way into heaven. Jesus does not tell us how to live, if you want to fill in the blank, a good life so we can go to heaven. Did you hear that? He doesn't tell us how to live a good life so to go to heaven. Now, he demonstrates, illustrates living a godly life, but he says going to heaven by living a good life, isn't, it doesn't work that way. Instead of us going to Jesus... And I thought that for a long time. I, I, you know, I'm the one that decided that I was going to turn my life over to Jesus. I'm the one that decided that now is the day to repent. You know what I found out? Just like we prayed for our young people this morning, that they would have an encounter that God would come to them. Because if we are left by ourselves to make the right decision, our nature will take us away from God and not towards God. So what Jesus does, which is different when we compare Christianity with all the religions of the world, the religions of the world says you've got to do this, this, and this to be accepted before Muhammad, Confucius, God, whatever. Instead, what Jesus does, he comes to us. He comes to us, he forgives us, amen, and saves us, if you're filling in the blanks, through his life and his death and his resurrection. Remember Easter, we had that video presentation where a guy fell in the pit, he couldn't get out, and all the religions of the world says, if you do this, if you pray, if you bow down, if you work hard, you do this and that, that you can get yourself out of the pit. What does Jesus do? He comes down into the pit, grabs the guy, puts him on his shoulder, and takes him out of the pit. Amen? You see, for a long time, because I didn't understand as a young boy, I thought, you know, I'm the one who initiated my salvation. I'm the one who exercised my faith. When I look at the Bible, it's the faith of the Son of God who loved me and saved me. It's God who chose me. It was God who had a plan for my life, and he showed mercy. Amen? And so he comes to us He's the initiator of salvation. Because we saw the result of man's fall. What did God said? I come not to be ministered unto, but to come to minister and to save those who are lost, who are blind. A person who doesn't know God may be intellectually astute and have all sorts of information, everything, but to be born again 
A person has to have a visitation from God. Amen? Where God comes to them and loves us, heals us, saves us, delivers us. Amen? God's grace is not available to those who morally outperform others. That's religion. But to those who admit their failure to perform and realize they need a Savior. Wow. That's amazing. And, and, and we, you know, we, we have to be careful that we don't think, well, if I earn all these merit badges and things, I'll position myself that I can be more acceptable to God. I thank God he accepts you and me as we are. But God is sovereign, but at the same time, we have to exercise our faith. And the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth because of what Christ has done for us. So you have the sovereignty of God and responsibility of the believer, how they work together, and we say, God, I messed up. I failed. I dropped the ball. Help me. And God comes and saves us and redeems us. Amen? Now, here's the interesting thing about Christianity. And you have all these questions and all these people are trying to put Christianity down, trying to... I remember a philosophy class in college, and the professor was an agnostic atheist. He's ranting and raving and all this stuff and everything. And um, what he wanted, essentially, give me some evidence... that you really know God. Give me some empirical evidence. That word empirical means evidence based upon observation or experience. Prove to me that God exists. I read Thomas Aquinas' book on the ontological argument for the existence of God, which sounds pretty good, but still it's inefficient. Who are we, human beings with a finite mind, trying to explain the fullness of God that exists? It's really impossible. And I said to this arrogant professor, what you are having trouble with is believing and having faith. And I saw a movie one time years ago where there was a scientific person and this Christian, this believer. And the young man was trying to convince the young woman that God is real, that he's personal, that he wants to have a relationship with us, and you can have the assurance and know that God is real and he lives in your heart and life. She said, prove it to me. He had a rhetorical question. He came back and he said, you've often talked about your father and how much he loved you and everything. Prove to me that your father loved you. She said, well, you heard what I've said. I said, my father loved me. He said, I don't believe you. Prove it to me. As she thought, and she realized, I can't. You just have to, to believe. If you believe, the Bible says, what's impossible with man, all things are possible with God. I believe, meaning I put my faith and trust in God. I have no empirical evidence that I'm born again that I can present to you. I don't have a contract written in the blood of Jesus, this or that or whatever. But what I say, what's in this book, and what I read has happened to me spiritually, and no one can disagree with that. Nobody. I know that I know that I know. And even the people who don't accept the truth of God's word are people who operate by faith each and every day. 
They have faith that the world started by some ooze that came out of the Lake Altoona. And all these other things are this explosion in space and all that. It takes a great deal of faith to believe that when it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the invisible things of God from the time of creation until now are clearly seen by those things that are made. Amen? I'm an outdoors guy. I can't help but I just walk through the fields along a river and just begin to enjoy the creation of God and look at so many different plants and trees and species of animal life and and how they all just are connected and work together. It's amazing. What amazes me is I like gardening that I can take a seed and put it in a pile of horse manure or cow manure and throw a little water on it and boom, something happens. I got tomatoes in my garden that are this tall now. I have enough to give everybody here 10 tomatoes. But you've got to come to church <laughs> to get the tomato. But I mean, it's just amazing. And then it's in that nasty stuff with worms and bugs and cow manure or chicken manure, and then we eat it. Yuck. Man, you got to believe there's a God. <laughs> um, God does not accept, point three, God does not accept believers because of their moral character, wisdom, intelligence, or good looks. Most religions and philosophies of life determine a person's spiritual status based on their, be filling in the blanks, religious attainments. When you study the religions of the world, the Eastern religions, and what it's presenting is if you want to be reincarnated to a higher place, if through Confucianism and, and all these things to be accepted before God, you got to morally perform and you got to produce yourself, position yourself so you can be accepted. Christianity is the complete opposite of that. You have to deny yourself. You have to admit that you're a mess. You have to come to the place that you've got to die in order to live. And you've got to say essentially this, I can't, I can't meet that high standard. I look at myself and I look at Diane and I said, I can't play the piano like her. I know I'm not going to heaven. I can't cook as well as her. I know I'm not going to heaven. I'm not as nice as she is and as sweet as she is. <laughs> I'm bad. I like watching Clint Eastwood and make my day. Diana says, oh, why do you watch those horrible movies? I just like to see the bad guys get it, that's all. <laughs> so I know if, if, if that's the way I'm going to be judged, I fall short. I've done some things I'm not proud of, and you've done some things you're not proud of. Even as a believer, I've done some stupid and foolish things. All of us have. Thank God that we're saved, past, present, future. Amen? I put my trust in, and I say, God, I need a Savior. The day I saw the light, and I need a Savior every single day. I need the grace of God every day. I need the forgiveness of God every day. I need God working and moving my heart each and every day. I continually 
rely upon the Lord and trust in Him every single day. Amen? And here's the good thing about God. He doesn't throw us away. Amen? And when we mess up, we feel guilty. We feel less than. And then I say, God, I repent. I don't want to do that. Forgive me. He does it. He doesn't drag it out. He does it like that. We're forgiven. Amen? You get up, dust yourself off, and begin to walk with Jesus. Amen? A person with a religious mindset accuses Christians of being hypocrites because of moral failures and imperfections. I've heard people use that. You know, I'd go to church, but you know what? I'm not going to because of all those hypocrites. Bunch of hypocrites. You ever hear anyone say that? There are people in the world, my next point, non-believers who are nicer, kinder, wiser, and act better than some Christians. That's a fact. You see, you're not redeemed because you're smart, you're good-looking, you're wise, and you've got all these moral perfections. God doesn't accept us based on those performances. He accepts you as you are. I told you about my buddy who for years wouldn't come to Jesus because he kept evaluating himself by looking at me and said, I just can't be like Larry. Therefore, I'm unqualified and validated. I said, you don't want to be like me. I'm bad. I said, God takes you as you are. Amen? And see, the world's out there, ah, look at that guy said he was a preacher. Look at he. He had a moral failure. He did this and he did that. I can go to any person in the Bible other than Jesus and find out that they dropped the ball and goofed up. Elijah got depressed. Samson was a womanizer. Peter denied Jesus. Paul was one of the worst persecutors of the early church. I mean, you go down the list. David committed adultery and then try to hide it by committing murder? I mean, come on. Thank God he's a merciful God. Can you say amen? Believers in Christ are not perfect, but they are forgiven, redeemed, and in the process of being changed in the image and likeness of Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. just want to read this to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Called us, amen, justified us, and is going to glorify us, amen? And so when God looks at us, we're a piece of clay, and so what's happening, he's taking us, And he's doing this in your life right now, in my life. He doesn't give up on us. Even when we goof up, make mistakes, when we say things we shouldn't say or think things we shouldn't think, but he takes it and he squeezes us, twists us, bends us, and he's in the process of making us like his son because he wants many sons and many daughters. Amen? So we're on a journey of being changed and transformed. It's called sanctification, being set apart into God, a work of the Holy Spirit. So then you have people who don't know God, 
you don't have the understanding of what it means to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and they'll point and say, you messed up. You say you're a Christian, and you behave that way, and you act that way. But I want to get to the point where I don't present any stomach block that they can't use me to excuse themselves. But they see Christ in me. They see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can you say amen? The Christian doctrine of salvation. Now, some of these things are not brand new to you, but it's important that we know these things, that we renew our minds, and that we can give good, sound, biblical answers. Amen? All people are created in the image of God. But everybody's not a child of God. I've heard people say, oh, everyone's a child of God. No, everybody's not a child of God. Everyone's created in the image of God. But to be a child of God, you've got to be born again. John chapter 3. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of the Spirit of God. Amen? So there's a difference between everyone's created in the image of God but to be a child of God, you've got to be born of God. Amen? Salvation is not man's idea initiated by his free will. Here's a correction. C.S. Lewis, strike out, said free will is the monument to hell. Here's, I misquoted, I was doing it based on memory. And I said, wait a minute, I think I made a mistake. C.S. Lewis said, hell is the monument to human freedom. If God leaves you and me to our own free will, we will go to hell. Romans chapter 3, verses 10, 11, and 12 says essentially this. The nature of man is against God. The nature of man is completely the opposite of what God wants us to be. If God leaves us to ourselves, our nature will take us away from God. That's why we need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? The problem we see in the world, and this is all these questions real simply, is God didn't want a bunch of robots. We have this thing called human freedom, free will, volition. And as a result, the man chose to disobey God, and that's the reason you see evil. That's the, what, the reason you see suffering and pain, because essentially God's will is that no one be thrown into a fiery furnace, but all come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus. That's the will of God. And he's made it possible for every person who's ever born to be born of the Spirit of God. But a person goes to hell because they say, not God's will be done, my will be done. My will be done. I've seen a commercial by Ronald Reagan's son. I don't believe in God. I'm not afraid and fearful of going to hell. Said that in a commercial on national TV. That is the epitome of arrogance. That's a young man who's blind. That's a dangerous place to be. I thank God he had mercy on me. Maybe I cannot be the most intelligent theologian but I got enough of Jesus in me. You got enough of Jesus in you. Amen. That earmarks us, secures us, gives us the earnest of our inheritance in Jesus to know him, to love him. Amen. Salvation is the result of the power of God through the gospel. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It's not our power. It's not our initiation Romans 1.16, Jonah 2.29 very clearly tell us salvation is God's idea. Salvation is the power of God through the gospel. Amen? 
Salvation by God's love and power, which is grace, through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Very clearly, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's not by works. Titus 3, 5 says the same thing. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but it's a renewing, regenerating work of the Holy Ghost. Amen? So I conclude with this. What about good works? I made the point that a person trying to earn favor, position himself to be set before God, cannot do it by living a good life. A lot of people think. I've had people say to me, you know what? You know, I, I don't need to do this. I don't need to do that. God's going to look at my life. I'm a, I've been a good person. Been married to the same woman all my life. Raised my kids. Earned a good living. Gave to the poor. Da, 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 all these good things. I'm a good person. And when I stand before God, he'll see I lived a good life and he'll accept me. That's a strong delusion. That's a deception. And a lot of people buy into that. And we see that we're not saved by our works, but our good deeds, our works, validates our faith in God. Faith without works, James said, is dead. And he says, my faith is validated by the things I do. Amen? Christians demonstrate their faith through their good works by producing fruit unto holiness. I already mentioned sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit within the life of the believer, which changes our behavior and our conduct. Amen? Good works of self-sacrifice, generosity, forgiving others, acts of kindness, loving, serving, edifying one another. All these things validate our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, I think some of the most important people in the kingdom of God, and not some of the great preachers necessarily, not discounting that, not some of the great theologians, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying that's bad. But I look at what Jesus said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, where I reign and rule, my spiritual kingdom, he says you must be willing to be a servant. I was at a breakfast yesterday morning with other uh, pastors. And there's a guy there who comes early. He prepares the breakfast for us puts out everything. He's not in our group. He's not a theologian necessarily. He's just a quiet guy behind the scenes, but he does it as unto the Lord. Great is your reward in heaven. Some of the people I think who are going to be kind of, I mean, excel, I guess I should say, in eternity are the people who are quiet, soft-spoken, but they're faithfully day in, day out serving God. A good pastor is not necessarily a great preacher or a great theologian. He's a servant. He serves the people. He loves the people. Same way the person sitting in the pew. Sometimes they think, well, I didn't lead as many people to Jesus as Billy Graham did, so, you know, uh, I, I'm probably going to sit in the nosebleed section in the great cathedral in heaven. And God doesn't look at things that way. I think when you look at some people who have suffered for the sake of Christ and did not deny the gospel, who are thrown into a prison and die there, Wow. lived a righteous life. No one ever knows about him. I walked past a cemetery one day years ago when I was hunting up in the mountains by myself. And I uh, thought about jumping off that, but I'll just do it. I'll behave myself. I was walking uh, through the woods. I was all grown up and everything. And I came across this little knoll. There's a cemetery. 
And so I just started looking at the little markers, and some of them you could read, some of them you couldn't read. I walked by, and some of the people died in the late 1800s, some of them even further back, the late 1700s. And no one visited that cemetery. It's forgotten. It's, it, the woods and the vines had just encompassed it. And I, I, I'm looking, at, and I could see some of the messages on the headstones indicated that the person probably was a believer. And some had just had their name and a date. I was thinking for a moment, I said, these people have forgotten. No one comes to the grave and no one's weeping over them and calling them to remembrance. They're forgotten. They lived their life. Some lived a few years because they were children. Some lived, you know, for a long period of time. Who remembers these people? Nobody. No one's coming there thought about that. I said, wow. And I, then I thought about myself. I said, I know I'm going to die one day. I'll be buried in the earth. hundred years from the date I die. Will anyone remember me? Anyone come by my grave and look at them? Man, I was Pastor Baker. He loved God, loved his family. He was a good man. Hundred years from the day I no one will remember me. I thought about that. All the maybe the good things, the good works I'd done. Who will remember what I did? Who probably when you know did I? He wasn't even a pastor of church. And then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, "It's not what man remembers, and maybe no one in, will know you in history." And as far as the earth goes and mankind goes, you're forgotten. But you know what's important? I know you. That's where it counts. I know you. It doesn't matter. He was the president of the United States. He was a great preacher. It was that or that. What's important is does God know you? That's where it counts. And you know what? You will not be forgotten. He calls us, he justifies us, and he glorifies us. That means he's on your side, he's rejoicing, you're my son, you're my daughter, I'm well pleased with you. What's important is not that history remembers you, does God know you.